Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday morning devotional time. If I don't know you, I'm Pastor Tyler, and I'm glad to be with you this morning. If you got your coffee or your breakfast or whatever you need to, uh, to sit and, and relax and engage with what we're going to talk about today. On Sunday, Pastor Joan uh, shared with us about Naaman's wife's maidservant, and I love that she, um, she gave her a name, Elsie, which was based off of the Hebrew name that had meaning. And I just thought that was a really uh, appropriate way to talk about this person that we know very little about, but who ended up being an important sidekick in Scripture. This morning I want to talk about somebody else, not because they're a sidekick. In fact, they're very much not a sidekick. But I got thinking about these, these people who we know in Scripture who have seemingly uh, insignificant roles, yet here they are. And one of them is a man by the name of Reuben. Now, Reuben is the oldest son of Jacob, the father of the people of Israel, and Reuben is the brother of Joseph. You may know more about Joseph. Joseph is the fellow with the coat of many colors. He was his father's favorite. He knew he was his father's favorite. His brothers knew he was his father's favorite. And just in case they forgot, Joseph was very careful to remind his brothers that he was special and his father's favorite. Now, if you've got siblings, you'll know that Joseph's approach here is just not wise, and it doesn't go well for him. Uh, Joseph ends up uh, making his brothers so angry they want to kill him, and eventually they sell him off to slavery and kick off an incredible chain of events that you can read about in the book of Genesis. This story starts in chapter 37, and it's absolutely fascinating. But the reason I want to talk about Reuben is because as I look at this story, and I was trying to look at it with fresh eyes, for many of us this is a familiar story. I noticed in chapter 42, and I don't want to spoil the story, but when, when Joseph and his brothers are reunited in Egypt many years later, there's this encounter. And Joseph knows he's looking at his brothers, but they don't know who Joseph is. It's been decades since they last saw him, and he was only a boy then, and he's been sold off to slavery, and a huge ordeal's happened, which isn't the story we're talking about. But Joseph ends up becoming the savior of his people during a famine, and provides food for uh, his, his father and their family and their, their whole uh, community, their whole nation during this famine, because Joseph finds himself as the second in command over all of Egypt. So when they come together, uh, the brothers finally realize who it is that um, who it is that they're dealing with. And Reuben says to his brothers, "Didn't I tell you we shouldn't do this? We shouldn't harm Joseph." It's a little bit of an "I told you so." But it got me thinking, did Reuben actually say that? I had missed that somehow when I read this story. And so I went back to the beginning in chapter 37, and here's what we find out. And I was fascinated. At one point, when Joseph comes to his brothers and they finally decide they need to get rid of him, they can't take it anymore, their plan is actually to kill him and throw him into a cistern. And they're going to tell their father that he was killed by a ferocious animal. And then Reuben hears about this. And something inside him, as frustrated as he, he seems to be with Joseph, something says, this isn't right. And so he says, throw him into the cistern in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Let's not kill him. His plan was when they all left, he was going to come back and rescue Joseph and take him back to his father. Now, I don't know what the end game there is, because that would not be a very uh, pleasant scene. However... They decide not to kill Joseph. They throw him in a cistern, and then this, this group of traveling, uh, well, they're, they're a caravan of, of like a nomadic people. They come by, and so they decide rather than killing Joseph, they're going to sell him uh, to this caravan, and that way they get a little bit of money, and they can still tell their father Joseph's gone, but they didn't kill anybody. They feel like they've got this all tied up with a nice little bowl on top. But remember, Reuben said, let's not kill him. And the reason this is fascinating to me is because, truth be told, Reuben's kind of playing along, but he has a, a conscience check, and he pulls back just a little bit. I wouldn't say that Reuben's actions here are admirable. I'd just say that he realized that what they were doing was wrong, and he did speak up and took action, or intended to take action against it. 
Now, as the story goes on, Reuben does come back to, to pull Joseph out of the cistern. He wasn't there when they sold Joseph off to the, to the caravan. And so when he comes back and finds Joseph's gone, he's pretty upset. And so he goes along with the, the plan of the brothers and they break the horrible news to, to Joseph's father, Jacob. And, uh, and they figure that's the end of it. And for a long time it is until they encounter Joseph later in his new position after this lifetime of God carrying through him through some pretty spectacular circumstances. And here's the thing. What I see here is that Reuben did all kinds of things wrong in playing along with this, uh, this, this plan of his brothers. But Reuben didn't ignore the little gut check in his conscience about what they were doing. Certainly, there's a lot of ways that, that Reuben could have acted better. But because he convinced his brothers with that short statement, let's, let's not do this, this isn't right, this put into motion the rest of Joseph's life, and God used that to make Joseph someone who would save his people from a famine. And I got rolling this around in my head. What does this mean? There's, there's this situation where something really terrible happened, and this is a really bad plan. This is an evil thing that Joseph's brothers are doing. No matter how frustrated you are with somebody, this isn't the way to deal with it. This goes against God's commandments. It's not what God has called them to. Of course, they haven't received the commandments yet, but this isn't who God is. I thought, what does that mean? How, how can I apply this? And I, I feel like what I'm getting from this passage, and I'd be interested in your thoughts too, but it's when we feel like something's wrong, even if we're not power, we don't have the power and authority to change the situation, it doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. It also means that it's in God's hands, not in ours. But if we have that check of conscience, especially when it comes to standing up for someone, uh, somebody's being wronged, like Joseph was very much being wronged. Reuben had no power to stop it, really. Perhaps as the oldest, he had a bit of authority. But this is a crowd of guys that are, are already decided what they're going to do. And all he does is talks them out of murdering Joseph. The rest of this unfolds. He intended to save Joseph, but uh, he wasn't going to lose any face in front of his brothers. He was going to come back and do it privately. So, you know, Reuben doesn't do a great job. But he does what was clearly right in his eyes, at least a little bit. And God used that to save an entire nation. I think that's worth thinking about. Oftentimes, I know myself, when I think about serving God, I try to think about things that are significant or important. And when I, uh, when I get it wrong, I tend to, to really be hard on myself, if I'm being honest. And I have to remember sometimes that God uses even the smallest things that we can do for his glory. And that's what I see in Reuben. This is a story that I've read many, many times, and I've never picked up on this one fact, this very small moment when Reuben says, let's not kill Joseph. I don't know what would have happened if, if he hadn't have spoken up, but he did, and here we are. And so that encourages me because sometimes I look at situations that are too big for me or they're way out of control or, or nothing I do is going to change anything. And I think this story helps me to understand that that's okay. It's not up to me to change it all. It's up to me to respond to the promptings God has put on me. And I may never know the outcome of doing that or it might be just like Reuben decades before I find out the significance of any moment. But the point is, God can use all of the parts of our lives for his glory. And so at all times, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we care for people, when we stand up for people, even if we feel like we aren't having an impact and we don't have the kind of influence that we would need to have an impact, that's a beautiful thing. God has all of it. God is sovereign and he uses what we do, no matter how small, for his glory and for his kingdom. And so we can feel good about that. And we can also heed the warning that when we are called to do something, when we feel that check that this isn't right, this, this person's being treated unfairly, or, or this is something that I, I, I know I need to not go along with, we need to understand that we don't have to change the world. We just have to respond to that sense from the Lord. 
way we can get better at discerning that. Spending time in our scriptures. Oops, I knocked my camera. Spend time in the scriptures. Pray and spend time with God. Not just talking, but listening to what he's saying to our hearts. Fellowshipping with, with other believers. And taking care of the people that God loves, which, by the way, is all of us. If we do those things, God can use even our small efforts to do really tremendous things. Even if we don't get it all right. I mean, like we've said, Reuben got a lot of this wrong. But God still used him. He became the father of and the founder of the tribe of Reuben, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he was a leader. And, and God used him in spite of all of his shortcomings. And he used this particular moment to change the course of history for his people. So let's not get caught up in what we think we can do. Let's remember who God is and what God can do. And know that when we follow him, we're able to be used. And what we do is able to be used by him for his glory. And I guess the flip side of that is when we don't, it may not go well. There are consequences to our actions, but God will still use that for his glory as well. So friends, I hope this stirred up some thoughts. It gave us a new angle to look at a different part of a familiar story. And as we close, I want to reflect on the fact that we often just don't know how our actions are part of our participating in the kingdom and how God will use what we do if we offer it to him and if we follow his leading. So let's pray and ask God to help us with that. And as you continue your week and head into the weekend, I, I hope that that will be fresh in your mind and that you can uh, maybe read this story and have a look for yourself and think about even the insignificant things that we do and how God could use them for his glory. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time to, to look at a, 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 a part of your word that maybe is familiar to, to, to some of us. And Lord, thank you for drawing my attention to a part of the story I had never noticed before. Lord, I pray that as we consider our own lives, our day-to-day -day lives, the mundane things we do every day, our interactions with people, even the ones that seem insignificant, Lord, help us to remember that wherever we are, whatever we're doing, you made us to be a reflection of your image to the world. And even the smallest, most seemingly insignificant action on our part as citizens of your kingdom can produce kingdom results and have a huge impact in people's lives. So Lord, I pray that you help us to be aware of that. Draw us close to you. Remind us of your presence and help us every day to be aware that you are present with us wherever we are. Help us to offer every situation to you. And, and seek your will in how to react, to respond, or to simply reflect your love to the people around us. God, I'm so thankful for what you're doing. These are uh, strange and sometimes difficult times, Lord, but you are still sovereign and on the throne, and you are still at work. Your spirit is, is doing amazing things, and I pray that you help us to be watching and ready to participate in what you're doing. We ask all of this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thanks for joining me, friends, and uh, I'll look forward to our next time together. Uh, come next week to see, uh, I believe it's Pastor John who will be sharing our devotion next week. So we'll see you next time. Bye for now.